good morning to everyone and for today's video I know it's been a long time and for today's topic it's about the common medication in skilled nursing facilities rehab long-term care or nursing homes okay so it's been a long time that somebody requested this from me and because I've had a lot of issues going on and I will share I will share that to you next time but for today I will discuss the common medication in a nursing home so for those who are very new especially for those Filipinos immigrants so I'm gonna speak in English at this time because we have several viewers or audience of Mama RN who are either Americans or foreign who can't understand Tagalog okay so for those who don't know because I know in Philippines we don't have nursing homes so um, SNF skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes is very new to us Filipinos okay so but giving you a glimpse of why this are or why we don't give IV push meds in a, in a nursing homes okay so th think about this in a hospital we have the ICU the step down right so say ICU those are patients who are really um, in a critical situation and once they are stable enough they are being transferred to a step down or a progressive care unit and once they are more stable then they will be transferred to a med surge unit okay then those patients under med surge unit once they are stable more stable but they still need strengthening say post-op patients they still need strengthening but they do not need intensive intensive care or um, more treatment inside a hospital they are being sent to a rehab okay so rehab or skilled nursing facility is a short-term um, period of time that they stay there just for strengthening doing therapy pain management or wound care something like that and then if the patient is old or they live alone and they don't have anyone who will take her, take care of them at home they eventually will be assessed if they need a long-term care okay it, it depends on what kind of condition say this patient is a stroke patient and she's living alone at home she's not living with a family and she's currently in a rehab and then say after three months they assess that she's not yet ready but but for a condition of a stroke it should be i mean they should be able to like progress in a rehab okay but say um they still have some um weaknesses or paralysis because of the extent of the condition and nobody will be um, able to take care of her or the patient doesn't like home health okay so they can always um opt to a home care if they want to stay in their homes but if the family say decided that they still want somebody to take care of their family they will be um, referred to a long-term care okay but for you guys to be able to understand why we seldom do IV in a nursing homes because in the hospital for them to be discharged they should be able to manage or at least be able to um, tolerate oral meds instead of the IV meds they should be able to win out of those IV meds for them to be discharged in the hospital because we don't do that in a nursing homes okay so for those who are very um, confused why we don't do um, NGT insertion, Foley cat. We do at times 
strike. We do oftentimes strike at, but not fully. We don't anchor any fully in the nursing homes. Um, IV push, we don't do IV push. We don't do IV insertion. We seldom do IV insertion unless it really a must, like say hydration. But in my whole stay in a nursing homes or a skilled nursing facility, I was not able to do any IV insertion at all. If they need some IV antibiotics, we do drips or we hang bags for antibiotic, but we really don't do push or IV push say. Mostly IV push meds are just pain medication and we really don't do that in the nursing homes. Okay, and um, we only do oral meds oftentimes in nursing homes. And mind you guys, um, in the nursing homes, mostly um, of the nurses there are LPNs, some has RNs, and QMAs. If we have IV push, they're not going to be able to do that. They need RNs to do it. Okay, so know your responsibilities, know your boundaries, know how to delegate, which is allowable and not allowable for QMAs and for LPNs. Okay, for QMAs, so for those who don't know what are QMAs, they are qualified medication aid. They are not nurses, they um, underwent training to pass oral meds. So they, they have some limitations on their scope, what they can give and what they cannot. Okay, so just to give you an overview, why? Because there's a lot of people who are asking me, um, what are the common meds? Do, they, um, do we insert IV? Do we give IV push? So IV push and IV bags are different guys okay so IV bags it's just you hang it you don't um, you don't do push okay so for those who don't have any experience at all okay IV push is a syringe or in a vial that you need to like um, get a medication in a vial or it could be um, a pre-filled syringe okay and you need you, you just need to push it Okay, that's the IV push. But the bag, the IV bag, those are, say, antibiotic that you need to mix up and and just hang it or give it to the patients. And mostly, these patients who need antibiotic or extended time for antibiotics to complete their um, course of treatment, they usually go to nursing homes with their peak lines, not with their um, IV lines or peripheral um, IVs. They... Um, usually have their peak lines. So peak lines um, are being used for a long-term um, use or long-term therapy or treatment or management if they require, say, um, like TPN or parenteral, so parenteral nutrition or most often, we don't do TPN in the nursing homes, but we do um, G2 okay feeding something like that okay so we always have the peak line instead of the iv lines okay so patients usually go out or being discharged in the hospital without the peripheral iv okay now let's go to the common medication so i there's a lot of medications in the nursing homes um but i just chose those um essential for you to know Okay, so rehab, for rehab or the skilled nursing um, facility, oftentimes they are post-op patients or the post-op, say, fracture or hip replacement that they required um, strengthening or extended care or therapy and they need to stay there for, say, 10 days to a month it depends on how they progress okay but these people um, usually needs pain management okay um, aside from those post-op post-op patients are the common patients in a rehab um, some of them are stroke patients too that requires therapy and speech occupational therapy you know 
to make sure that they are being fed um, safely until they're able to gain their strength back to their um, previous status. Okay, for the long-term care, people in the long-term care, mostly we do not do treatment anymore. So in a long-term care or nursing homes, mostly these patients um, are really living there. Okay, so nursing homes is their home already. So they just do home meds if they don't have um, present um, issue, present um, problem, but mostly in a long-term care, um, what they need is either, so they usually have their home meds, um, if they acquire some infection, say pneumonia or UTI, we treat it um, by antibiotic, oral antibiotic, okay, or wound care, but we really don't treat them with any serious condition. So whenever patients need more um, assessments or more treatment or management, we send them out in the hospital. Okay, so we do not manage them in a nursing homes. Okay, we send them out for you guys to understand why we don't do um, why we don't do how med search field or med search environment does things for their patients because it's really different. Okay, so the ac acuity is different in a nursing homes and in a in a hospital. So you have to. Um, understand first the difference of those two okay now let's go to the medication um, I'll go first to the narcotics or the pain meds okay so narcotics as we all know these are pain med medications mostly are opioids okay so first of all if you're giving narcotics and these narcotics are being counted all the times okay make sure to check the rr or the respiratory rate and the blood pressure because these are vasodilators and we all know that it can depress respiration it can um give hypotension okay so number one common um narcotic is the narco or the hydrocodone plus the acetaminophen Okay, so the hydrocodone plus acetaminophen, we call it sometimes Norco, Vicodin, or Lortab. And mind you guys, these medications has different dosages. They have the same name, but they have different dosages. We have 5 to 325 milligrams. We have 7.5 to 325 milligrams and 10 milligrams to 325 milligrams. Okay, so always, always be mindful to check the dosages, not just the name, okay? Because the name are all the same. They're all hydrocodone with acetaminophen, but different dosages, okay? So be very, very careful. Number two is what we call Percocet. Percocet is the brand name, but this is an oxycodone with acetaminophen, Okay, so oxycodone with acetaminophen, we call it Percocet. Same thing with Norco, it has different dosages. Um, it has 5 to 325 milligrams, 7.5 to 325 milligrams, and then 10 milligrams. Okay, so again, like Norco, you have to be very careful with the dosages, not just with the name. Okay. Next is the oxycontin, or we call it oxycodone. So it only has oxycodone alone in that medication. It doesn't have any acetaminophen, okay? So oxycodone mostly has five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams. Next is tramadol. We all know the tramadol or the ultram. I know for Filipinos, there are very very common in our country okay so those are the pain meds and usually being given either um <clears throat> every four hours or every six hours it depends on the condition of the patient and how they tolerate pain okay 
Um, next will be bedtime meds. Okay, so bedtime meds. Um, oftentimes, these patients have trouble sleeping at night, so they are being prescribed with medications. So first is the melatonin, and that is the most common um, sleeping aid. They have three milligrams, six milligrams, up to nine milligrams. Okay, next will be trazodone. So trazodone are trazodone is an antidepressant and sedative. Um, but if the patient has really high tolerance, say high tolerance with um, say melatonin, it's not effective anymore for them. Usually they are being prescribed with a trazodone. Okay, um, next we will be hydroxycine. So hydroxycine or atherox, if you will hear atherox, this is actually an antihistamine and it is being given for anxiety and for itching pill. But at most times, this is also being given to help them relax because it's an anti-anxiety for them to be able to sleep. Okay, so every morning there's it's either there's an NP or there's a doctor in your facility that they usually do rounds say uh, once or twice a, a week and they usually assess all the residents we call them residents right and they assess if this patients really need sleeping aid or it's just their anxiety that makes them awake okay next will be alprazolam alprazolam or Sanax. This is an anti-anxiety anti and has a sedative effect. And mind you guys, alprazolam or Sanax is a habit forming, while the hydroxyzine doesn't have any addictive um, content or it's not a habit forming unlike Sanax. So be very, very mindful of those side effects. Okay, so those are the bedtime meds. Next will be um, diabetic meds. Okay, so for diabetes, we only have, um, we usually have the short acting and the long acting insulin. Okay, so long acting insulin, guys, or we call it basal insulin or background basal insulin. It is being given with or without food, okay? So we're not really particular if the patient was able to eat their meal or not because this insulin is already calculated based on their basal or their background, okay? So it means that they need this insulin regardless of their meal, okay? For the short acting, short acting requires meal so you will not give your short acting insulin if they're not eating at all okay you have to make sure that the patient was able to eat their meal before you give your insulin okay so short acting um these are lispro aspart and then for the long acting usually the name is lantus levomir or basaglar Okay, so those are the insulin or the diabetic meds. Now, let's go lastly to the hospice medications. So in the nursing homes, most of our patients there are hospice, especially in a long-term care because those patients who have, say, terminally ill patients and they don't have anyone to take care of them at home they usually go to the long-term care um, and they usually ended up in either palliative or under hospice care when you say hospice care it means that we are just waiting for the right time for our lord to get them but with a hospice care we provide comfort or end-of-life care for them okay so we make sure that we provide the quality of life 
remaining for them and mostly for these hospice patients they discontinue all, all um, treatment meds or other medication that will continue to provide um, treatment okay so the goal of a hospice um, medication is just to give comfort and usually these hospice medications are only two to three medications okay number one is morphine um, for all hospice patients we always have morphine for them okay um, the brand name usually is Roxanol or MS Contin. Usually it is being given as needed every two hours or every four hours. Um, that's for pain. If you, if you, if you see your patients, um, you think that um, she's having, um, say, green maze or restlessness you would know you would know if your patient is in pain then you would give your morphine okay next will be Ativan Ativan or Lorazepam this is being used for restlessness or tachypnea or very high respiratory rate if they're having anxiety or shortness of breath and agitation so again because they are terminally ill patients, they have they still have um, something going on in their body, any symptoms, they're in, always in pain because of their um, conditions. And we give this to provide comfort until their end of life, okay? And mostly these medications are in a liquid form because along the way, they decline until they go to an active um, dying phase it is easy to give them via liquid form okay so usually a dropper you just drop it in um, in their mouth okay until their end of life okay so um these are the most common medications that you can find in a nursing homes. Of course, there are still a lot of other meds like the cholesterol meds, the usual metropolol. So I, I would want to share metropolol, guys. So metropolol are being given not just for the high blood pressure. Mostly, it focuses on the heart rate of a patient. So always check your heart rate when giving metropolol because metropolol can decrease their heart rate so if you're ha if your patient are having 60 below you have to contact your doctor or your on call or your supervisor or whoever that you need to um, it depends on the the protocol in your facility let them know or hold it for a while inform them notify them that this is the heart rate and then don't give it okay because the heart rate will continue to drop if you keep on giving the metropolol atorvastatin or the lipithor is for the cholesterol and it is being given usually at night or in the evening why um, it is being given in the evening because our cholesterol peak hours is at night so they usually give it there okay um usually also they um we have warfarin or coumadin or the um blood thinner okay and you will notice that usually they give it in the afternoon usually 4 or 5 p.m um the warfarin or coumadin is actually can be given at any time as long as you will take it or they will take it at the same time daily but if they're in the facility they usually put it or schedule it at 4 or 5 p.m in the afternoon why because if ever they have these changes or adjustment in dosage they have enough time you know to have it change because the medication will be scheduled in the afternoon so it means that when the doctor needs to do rounds or to assess the patient they don't need to 
if they need to change it right away they can change it right there and then instead of waiting for the next day so that's the only rationale why they um, putting it or scheduling it in the afternoon okay um, lastly because we have peak lines in the nursing homes you would hear um, the alta place or the anti-clot or the clogger of the peak line so oftentimes or sometimes peak line can be clogged because um, of a lot of factors right um, medications fluids the content or or the characteristics of their blood or it depends on how the nurses is taking care of the lines as well okay so make sure make sure to always flush your lines very well to avoid clots or clog just in case you have your peak line clog or you need to draw blood and you're not able to draw blood the declogger or the anti-clot or we call it alteplase that's the the main medication that we are using for the declogger we do not push it guys okay be mindful do not push it so always read the instruction from the pharmacy we just push it in a certain amount dwell it in the line so peak line has a specific capacity for a milliliters amount of either medications or your flush okay so you need to just um, instill your alteplase dwell it there wait for like 30 minutes and then you aspirate it first to remove it before you flush it never 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 flush your alteplase right away with your peak line okay you just dwell it and then aspirate it before you flush it okay so just giving you um points to remind about the alteplase so that's all guys for the common medications in a nursing homes long-term care or rehab again please don't ask why we do not do ngt insertion fully people or patients in a nursing homes or in a rehab are mostly elderly these are old people and we are trying to avoid any more um needle sticks any thing that could add to their skin breakdown okay aside from that is for their safety any contraptions like tubings foley cats are factors for accidents okay so when they are always bear in mind that our goal for these patients is for them to get up regain their strength and they're able to do what they usually do prior being um, admitted in the hospital okay so that's the goal our goal is for them to help regain their strength back okay we just do not I'm sorry that's the alarm <laughs> I apologize that's the Friday alarm here in our county um, they usually um, release the alarm at this time 11 11 a 11 a.m. or 12 noon and 5 p.m. every Friday you know okay so again um, if they need more treatment more management or if you assess as a nurse that they need more extensive care we send them out to the hospital we treat them in the hospital okay we do not try to treat patients with sepsis say if you are assessing the patients and you find that the patient is having sepsis we usually send them out right away we do not try 
to treat them on our own in a nursing home unless they are stable enough to be back in the facility for for an extended management okay but for any acute care we send them out to the hospital so that's the clarification for those who are asking me why it's not like MedSurge nursing homes or skilled nursing facility is a step down of a med surge okay they're not the same level the acuity is often stable than the hospital acuity and that's the reason why the ratio is different in the hospital versus in a nursing homes okay again we do not do iv insertion ngt foley most of the medications are oral meds or we use IV bags for those extended antibiotics. We have we they usually have peak lines other than the peripheral lines. Seldom that we insert IV for them unless it is really necessary for just for hydration. Okay. But other than that, we do not do anything um like IV push okay so hopefully guys um you're able to learn something from me and for those um common medications in a nursing homes or skilled nursing facility and stay tuned for the next um common medication this time for the hospital okay see you guys